Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey, how are you? I'm just fine. And you? Fabulous. Fabulous. Let me pull this up yeah. so I can do full screen. And I'm going to stop share. There we go. Okay. All right. I can see what I'm doing. All right. Well, you want a quick tour of the studio before we start? Hold on one second. Yeah. I just, we're, so YouTube is a 30 second delay. And I just want to make sure it catches up with us. So get ready, it's going to catch up now. So get over there and like. Screen is not. Yeah, give it a second. Yeah. See, it, it, maybe it's more than 30 seconds. It's only supposed to be 30 seconds, but I, I have a feeling it could be like 60. Uh, when they found out it was me, they probably want two minutes. Right? They're like, wait, we'll, we'll catch up. <laughs> all right let me know when we're good octavius i got i got my my people are making sure we're okay in the corner here so so we're good uh-huh i'm not doing a split screen i might just show like that oh am i not oh that's bummer okay well unless i do what, what should i do then what do you think I really don't know. all right well how about you just take a picture of mike then okay that'd be great okay, so Mike, smile. I'm going to take your picture. You're on YouTube. <laughs> okay. That's not a pretty sight. Nah.
Give me a thumbs up and we're good. Yep. Awesome. All right. Here we are. Friday the 14th. Talking to one and only Mike Vosberg. My, the little me is jumping for joy. <laughs> because it was probably 1986 for me. The issue came out in 1980, but I found it at a flea market of Savage She-Hulk number four. And uh, on the cover, she's about to crush her father. And uh, it says, uh, her father wants to kill her. And I was like, what's this about? And I loved the Incredible Hulk. And I had no idea that there was a She-Hulk. And then I found out She-Hulk actually was in charge of herself. Like she, she wasn't like a mindless brute. She actually had a mind. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Actually, and, Dave and I were in charge of the She-Hulk. So we were gonna So originally everyone was watching. The, the idea was um, I wanted to get the, the, the original She-Hulk gang together because uh, with the TV show coming out and likely She-Hulk in the movies, which I'm excited for. She Hulk's one of my, she probably is my favorite Marvel character. And that's close because I love Spider-Man, love a few others, but She Hulk, she's right up there. I really like She Hulk. I have a, a close connection to She Hulk. I love the Savage She Hulk series. And I feel that other creators get a lot of recognition for the She Hulk. There's John Byrne, there's Roger Stern, there's Ryan Hitch, all the guys from the, the mid to late 80s on, but none of it could have been possible if not for David Anthony Kraft and Mike Vosberg. You guys really set the groundwork for that. And I followed you through She-Hulk, G.I. Joe, Cloak and Dagger. Uh, you did some independent stuff. You did some um, well, Archer and Armstrong. You, you kind of continued on, but then you kind of like left comics and went on to do bigger and better things, which I find fascinating. So I'm excited to talk to you about that. Um, how did you get into comics? Let's start. Let's just jump right in. How did you get started in comics? Oh, man. I got started in comics a long, long time ago in terms of I produced one of the very first comic book fanzines. In the 60s, so, right? In the 60s. So uh, I was doing my own little homemade comics, and I did good fortune to grow up in Detroit, which is where Jerry Bales pretty much started comic book fandom. Mm -hmm. So I called him up on the phone and said, wow, you know, uh, and he was kind enough to talk with me. And um, so, yeah, I probably by the time I was 14 or 15 years old, through comic fandom, I met 90 percent of the people I was going to work with for the next 15 years, like 15, 20 years, um, either other fans writing to me like like one day I got a call from uh, Len Wein and Marv Wolfman they were wow. a couple years younger than me they called me up I think they even called me up collect which was really funny mm. from uh, from New York I lived in Michigan and uh, they said hey you you make a comic could you tell us how to do that and uh, and so you know I talked to him at some length and uh, um, and that was fun and and we had a ton of guys in the, in the neighborhood that uh, when I say neighborhood, I'm talking about Detroit in general. Yep. I lived in Pontiac. Um, one day I got home from football practice and there's this kid, you know, waiting for me. It turned out to be Jim Starlin and he had oh, a bicycle over from, uh, you know, Berkeley, which is about 20 miles away. He was like probably 13 at the time. And uh, so I got to be good friends with him and now Milgram. And uh, there's like, you know, uh, Terry Austin was, was in that group a little later, and, yep. and Rich Buckler, Arvell Jones, Keith Pollard, uh, Mike Nazar. I mean, there was uh, Tom Orzakowski, letterer. Uh, and it really made a difference because you had somebody as a kid, mm. you could bounce your work off of, mm. uh, get response from, get it printed in a fanzine where you could actually see it. Um, and you made all these connections for later on that, uh, I mean, when I tried to break into comics, uh, I needed all the help I could get. Um, <laughs> and I mean, when I walked into Marvel or DC, they all knew me. I mean, you know, the editors were like, oh yeah, I've seen, you know, I've seen your fanzine. So, I mean, they were at least aware of who I was. Um, didn't help much, but- uh, What was uh, it about comics that you liked so much in the 60s? Like, and all of you, what was it about the energy of comics? You just listed a whole bunch of people. Why do you think all of you were so into comics? Um, 
it was the new quick way to become a rock star. Mm. Um, I mean, it was, if you want to make a movie in the sixties, you had to be well off enough to be able to afford a camera that actually shot film. Sure. Then you had to, you know, get your friends to help you with it. Then you had somebody, if you wanted sound was like, oh, forget that. Right. I mean, that was a very difficult process. If you wanted to write a book, you know, you could do it, but then you had to get it published. Comics, you could you could sit down, you could do your own homemade comics in your room. That I, I started doing that when I was, I met my friend Fred Jackson hmm. uh, when I was in sixth grade. And he's telling me about it. He, he was making his homemade comics. And I said, oh, cool. So we formed our own little company called Voxen. And we would do these comic books and trade them back and forth. That was great for me because I started to look at comics a little more closely then and actually became more artists. So, I mean, uh, I wanted to be a mad comic book artist. That's the first thing I wanted to do. And so, you know, Jack Davis and Wally Wood were my heroes at the time. Um, when I started to look at the, at the kind of the straight stuff, um, comic books were cool. What was really neat were the uh, newspaper strips because that's literally where the cream of the cartoonists were working. Sure. So, I mean, you know, you had Leonard Starr doing on stage, which was my favorite. Yep. You had, uh, you know, Harold Foster doing uh, Prince Valiant. Uh, you had John Cullen Murphy doing Big Ben Bolt. I mean, uh, John Prentice was, was also doing a strip in there. I mean, just yeah, all these guys that you could, you know, you, you were looking at and, um, and they all got to sign their work. The problem mm -hmm. with comics is you kind of had to, to check around to see who's, whose work you were looking at. Mm. Um, I mean, one of my heroes was, was like Joe Kubert. Yep. And I remember as a five-year-old kid um, getting this comic book because I'd go out to my aunt's house. And when I, you know, when I left, when we, we'd drive back home, she would literally give me a stack of comics like this that she'd bought for her niece and she'd read them all. So there was like, you know, Uncle Scrooge and Tarzan and Betty and Veronica and Classics Illustrated. Uh, there were Western comics. There was all these things. Um, but I remember getting this one. And as I'm looking at it, I'm starting to read through it. And there's this guy being attacked by a big octopus. And then another couple of pages later, there's this guy and these cavemen crush him underneath the rocks. And I'm just like, Oh, and I remember slamming the book shut and going like, Oh, this is just too scary to read. <laughs> and, but I mean, but that image stayed with me. And I remember when I was a teenager, I saw, um, I think the first thing I probably saw was, was flash which I thought was, well, this is pretty neat. Hmm. But then when I saw the next issue, it was like, oh, it's not quite the same. And Kubert had inked the first issue for, uh, with Infantino. Um, and about the same time, there was a strip came out called The Viking Prince. Yes. And I'm, I'm like, as, as I'm looking at it, there are things that stirred in my memories going like, you know, I bet this is the same guy who did that. You know, I can remember that, uh, um, you know, um, when I heard about Tor, when I got into comic fandom, the older guys were telling me about other Kubert comics and one of them was Tor and I'm going, yeah, that's the one I, I saw. So, I mean, by the time Hawkman came around, right. I was already a major Kubert fan. So the idea that, that he was doing this, this strip was just perfect for me because um, in the sixties, everything was done linearly. Mm -hmm. Guys drew an outline and then it was given to the colors and they colored it in. Joe was like painting everything with black and white. Hmm. Uh, the, the way that, that like, you know, guys in newspaper strips, actually, uh, Leonard Starr is very strong at that. Uh, hmm. Foster was strong at that. Um, so, I mean, I, I love the stuff. And it was, um, there was this sense of looseness to it. Mm -hmm. So that's what got me really excited. On the other hand, nobody else liked Hubert. <laughs> It was, you know, it's, it's, it's like when Hawkman finally got his own book, the first thing they did was Julie Schwartz bounced him off. Right. Gave it to, uh, he was at Murphy Anderson and somebody That's right. was just like, oh, come on. You exactly. Know? And uh, I mean, and it wasn't like Joe was short of work because he was, uh, he had the long, you know, the, the army books going. But I love it though, because I mean, that was like, your work was like, for me, again, she Hulk number four, one of my first comics. I have such a clear memory. I have so many copies of the issue because it's just, stuck with me something about it and it was your artwork 
that I recognize because I feel like, and we'll talk about your style later, but you had like a distinct style that I just thought was incredible, right? Mm -hmm. And I can see where you would have a cougar influence to that. That's amazing. Well, I certainly had a cougar influence, but I never thought of myself having a distinct style because when, as you get into comics, the first thing you're trying to do is figure out how am I supposed to draw this right. so that the editors will hire me, that people will like it. Yep. Um, and somewhere buried underneath there is the, and it should look good too. Right, right. But I mean, that's kind of the afterthought. As you get older, that's the first concern. And and the other ones, uh, you know, kind of go by the wayside. But uh, um, and beyond comics, I mean, my big influence is I can remember as a kid, I would go into the library and, you know, uh, with my parents, uh, we didn't have a TV set. Mm -hmm. uh, I was probably the only kid on the block. So I had to read a lot of books as a kid. And um, I'd get, you know, the books I was going to read for the next week. And then I would go and I'd find every one of the, uh, I don't know what you remember, the, the, they were called Scribner Classics. Sure. And N.C. Yeah. Wyeth yes. did any number of them. And, and I think Dean Cornwell did a couple or whatever, you know, it's like, and so I would get those books and I would do nothing but just go to the illustrations and stare at them. So you were and, always into art then? You, you, you knew you were going to be an artist from the very, from a young age? No. Okay. I like to draw. Yeah. But okay. Hell, you know, it was like a young age. I wanted to be a fireman or a cowboy or something. You know? Right. It was it was it was like, and so I I drew so I could illustrate those fantasies. Wow. Um, but um, no, I mean one of the things about growing up in a factory town in the fifties is you didn't think about growing up to become an artist. Interesting. You know that was that was a like I said that was a rock star occupation. Um. So. I mean, but I was looking at, at like, you know, like the illustrators like that, but the other big influence on me, probably more so than, than, uh, uh, than comic books mm. were um, stories. I mean, reading because I love stories and movies. Yes. I mean, movies were just, it was, it was like comics were cool, but movies were the end all. Yep. Um, I mean, they were just, uh, uh, there was nothing like, I, I think there's a line somewhere somebody came up with like, you know, like uh, uh, being alone in the dark in your own world. Mm. And, and that's what it was going to movies as a kid. You know, it's just like the lights went down, this thing came up on the screen and you were just entranced for the next couple of hours. So those, the, it's like Hitchcock was my big favorite as a kid and, and uh, you know, the, and Western movies. I and mean, we saw every Randolph Scott that ever was on. And um, usually we'd go to a double feature on a Friday night. So, you know, you were seeing kind of these cheesy movies, but they were, they were just, they were great. But when I get into comics, I didn't know anything about drawing. Wow. What I did understand was, was um, the storytelling process. Or, or at least what was a good story and, and how, you know, what did you want to do with it and things like that. Do you like consider that. yourself, okay, so I guess that's my, I ask every artist this because I consider myself a storyteller. I, I, I paint in oil. Every pen okay. I have tells a story. Um, I tell my students, um, you know, you're, the, you, you're an artist, yes, but you're also a storyteller. However, right. you do, whether it's a sequential piece of art or if it's a piece, do you consider yourself an artist or an illustrator or a storyteller or what would you classify yourself? All those. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that I discover with younger artists is it, it, they want to draw comics when they're kids, but they quickly, mm. they go one or two ways. They want to be, they want to create the image. Yep. I don't mean image comics, but I mean, they want to be a painter mm. and in that they're more concerned with the craft and, and a more esoteric look at, at things. Yes. Um, or you want to tell a story. Yep. And, you know, it's like, I do a lot of painting, but if my paintings don't tell a story, it's like, mm. well, I don't want to do this. I mean, that's my focus. I think of myself primarily as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, and I use pictures to tell my stories rather than um, uh, uh, just writing. Yeah. So, um, I but see, I have up on the screen, I have just images of a couple of your paintings and they're from films. I see that you do like Hitchcock, don't you? 
Oh yeah. I mean, he, he, I, what I like about Hitchcock was when I was seven years old, his films fascinated me. Yeah. At 70 years old, I can still watch Hitchcock and I'm fascinated. Um, I can't say that about the Prince Valiant film. You know, it's a, uh, uh, what is your favorite Hitchcock film? Uh, probably, um, uh, to catch a thief. You that know, was my it, partner. That's his favorite as well. It, it's just, it's a very light, um, in the fifties, Hitchcock had the best people working with him in terms of his, his writing staff. He had Bernard Herman doing the music, uh, you know, the cinema, great cinematography, the actors, he had Cary Grant and, and Grace Kelly. Mm -hmm. Um, he had the perfect conglomeration. Um, and everybody said, you know, Alfred Hitchcock. And I'm thinking, yeah, it wouldn't be Alfred Hitchcock without. Exactly. And, you, know, oh. you start to name all these people. And, and I mean, you can see it's like when he goes suddenly from those kind of films uh, into does like, you know, the wrong man. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like about the bleakest noir film you can imagine. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see a real shift, which, um, like I said, I'm sure Hitchcock loved, I don't know about his audience at the time, you know. Agreed. Was, well, so. even as an artist, you do. So, I mean, oh, and we'll get there. I am, I'm jumping all around, but I think you also said like kids start off, you wanna do comics or you go one way or the other, right? And I feel like as an artist, filmmaker, otherwise, you go one way and then you go in another creative path, right? Mm -hmm. So when you started in comics, you were trying to get a job, you were trying to please the editor. Um, what else were you thinking about when you got into comics? Um, by the time I got into comics, I had graduated from college and I taught school for three years. Okay, so that's I mean, right. I wasn't, I wasn't a kid. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was an adult. So um, teaching school had a big effect on me too in terms of comics, in terms of it taught me that this is a job. Get it in mm -hmm. on time. Mm -hmm. You're working for people. What do they want? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, you know, oh, it'd be fun to draw a page of my comic book today. You know, it was, it was, so I mean, from teaching, you got the sense of professionalism. Yes. Um, and so as soon as I got my first job in comics, I remember it was, there was an editor at, at Gold Key who hired me. Wow. Uh, who apparently knew nothing at all about art or comics because he's looking through my stuff and he goes, well, you seem like a very nice young man. I'll see <laughs> if I can give you a couple stories, you know? And, um, and that was great. I mean, that's, that's that's how you got your foot in the door you you know you got a couple jobs and and you learn from doing them but um as soon as i started it was like who do i like so for mm. me it was like you know i like Kubert, i like wood uh, i like leonard star okay i'm gonna draw my pictures like them once i started to work for the companies then it became at marvel we liked jack kirby mm -hmm. uh, at dc we like Neil Adams, you know, it's just, what, what are we looking for in terms of the house style? I, I mean, one of the interesting things that would happen to me is I would do stories for Gold Key and I would turn them in and they'd go, pretty nice, but next time you're drawing the heads way too small. The head should be bigger. I go, okay. And then I'd get my story from Marvel and I turn it in Marvel and Marvel would look at it and go, yeah, pretty good, but boy, your heads are way too big. Right. Oh, your course. head's a little smaller. Because they were trying to sell the heroic proportion. Yes. Whereas working for Gold Key, you were trying to sell a realistic figure. Absolutely. Um, so you really had to kind of uh, figure out not only what what your your editors wanted, but what the what your fans wanted, because um, eventually they were going to be your real. Uh, uh, they were going to choose whether you were around or not because editors, you know, it's like, they're always going, what do the fans want? Mm -hmm. And um, so if you can get there ahead of them, um, you know, then you had it figured out. So Mike, help us out though for like the kids who are watching, because there was no email back then. You had to show up, correct? I mean, you had the telephone, but you had to bring in your portfolio. How did you get a job? Like, how would you... Well, A, like I said, I was living in Pawnee at the time and people were just beginning to work through the mails. I mean, like certain like, like Toth had worked through the mails for years once he moved to um, mm -hmm. uh, Los Angeles, but also um, Russ Manning. 
um, side story. Uh, you know who Russ Manning is, right? Uh, I do, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, when I was drawing fanzines, I was a big Russ Manning fan. I loved his Brothers of the Spear. That's right. And um, I was, you know, I was, you know, would get my daily mail with like three or four orders for the magazine. And, you know, here's mm -hmm. my quarter. Please send me another issue. And I, I get this one. It's got this really neat printing on it. I'm like, well, this guy prints really neat, you know, and I'm thinking, I wonder, wonder if I could talk to him and maybe see if he could letter some of our stories, you know, because, I mean, you were always looking for talent. Sure. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, let's just start that guy, Russ Manning. Russ Manning! Wow. Russ Manning wrote oh. me. I mean, it, it literally, as a kid, that, you know, it's like the idea that, that someone like that would write you, it just didn't sure. seem So, I mean, it was literally like several hours later when that hit me, like, oh my God, I got a letter from Russ Manning. You know? <laughs> and um, I mean, those are the kind of things, and like I said, but again, he's working in California. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the most of the people are in New York. For me, um, when Starlin got work, that made it real for me. Mm -hmm. Because up until that time, like I said, it was kind of like, like you know, it was a, it was a, you know, your rock star fantasy or movie star fantasy. Right. Um, but once Jim started working, and then Alan and and um, 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 Buckler and all and these guys, it was like, wow, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. Your family's cool. Was your well, yeah, because was your family okay you leaving education to go into a career like that, like a rock star career? I'm sure most of my friends and family thought it was nuts. Yeah, uh, but you also have to understand that at that time, I probably had the last draft deferment in America because mm -hmm. uh, I was teaching school, and so when I got out of college, I got a deferment for the next two or three years. Well. About the third year, they had these, this thing called the lottery. Mm. And my lottery number was so high that the draft board said, you know, just volunteer for, you know, that we can pick your number and your number's too high to be picked. Yep. And um, that took a leap of faith because uh, I'd been lied to so many times by them. Sure. That, uh, it was like, hmm. Um, but after my third year, it was like, okay, I don't have to worry about if I stop teaching. I'm going to, um, um, wow. you know, run into, I mean, the other big thing that happened to me was like, in, after, in high school, I got really just, just became a basketball fanatic. Yeah. In terms of like, you know, I mean, I wasn't any good. I just loved the game. Um, and I played all the time too. So, I mean, that, that's what I was doing with my free time. Well, I think when I was probably in my second year of teaching or first or second, or whatever, I remember in the summer, I sprained my ankle really bad playing basketball. I couldn't play for the next two or three months. So I went, mm, okay, I guess I'll start drawing again. And I went back into, you know, into doing drawing and comics. And I just, it was like, I never went back after that. Wow. So, um, so I mean, I was doing a lot of, of work drawing, but it was the blind leading the blind. I, I mean, I knew wow. how to copy other people. You know, mm -hmm. I knew how to look at other people and go, Ooh, I like that. I'll Take try it until it. you make it. Well, but I mean, no one ever taught me about, um, you know, like the, the basics of like form, mm -hmm. line, mm -hmm. shading, texture. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know any of that stuff. And, and wow. once I got my first job, that's the first thing that occurred to me was like, wow, got a job. Now I better learn how to draw. Yep. You know, and, wow. and like I've spent the next 50 years now trying to, you know, catch up from that. So unreal. So you started with DC or Marvel first? Who who was it first? Mm, I started probably at Gold Key. Okay, Gold Key. That's jobs. right. All right. No, actually, my first jobs, um, I I did like underground stories. Yeah, okay. Because I mean that was it was a that was a way to get your work published. Sure. You know, you can do weird stuff. Um you know, I went directly from teaching at St. Michael's school to drawing stories in bizarre sex, you know, so, of course, you know, so, um, that's and, how it works uh, though. I'm yeah, a recovering well, Baptist preacher's son and, you know, people in bizarre I'm, sex I'm, read my stories. You know, exactly. You should see my paintings. Totally. Right. Like we got to get it out there somehow, I guess. So, um, so, I mean, that's where I got my first published work. And also you meet new people and you meet contacts. I mean, one of the guys doing undergrounds at the time was Richard Corbin. Mm. And I remember getting the most astute letter of criticism from him because I sent him one of my stories. And, mm. and uh, when he sent it back, it was like, you know, like, no, we, we can't use this. But he said, 
I think you have a problem of you haven't really decided whether you're trying to do um, a poster image on a 2D page or whether you're trying to create the illusion of a 3D image on the page. And it was just like a light went off like, yep. oh, you know, and, but I mean, I, nobody ever said that to me when you were, you know, it was like, it was like, you know, put more lines on his arm. You know, I was, I was about as far as it went, you know. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff. And that was the biggest problem I had. Like, like when I would come into New York, Milgram and Starlin were living there then. So, I mean, I could crash at their, you know, at uh, Milgram's place. He was always very kind about that. Mm. And uh, eventually he being shared space with um, Simonson. Yep. So, I mean, come into the apartment and always be Walt and, uh, and, and Al. So it was like, it was great to come into the city and, you know, and take stuff around. But um, um, I, like I said, I was in the right place at the right time, mm -hmm. started getting work and. Um, it pays well. What's that? Does it pay well? Like, I mean, you could make a wage. You could have a living wage off of comics. Well, you have to remember what wages were at that time. Sure. Um, my dad was a janitor. I say janitor, he was, he was in charge of the building. So he was actually mm -hmm. a building engineer. Um, I don't think he ever made more than $120 a week uh, well into the late 50s, early 60s. And, mm -hmm. and on that income, he put four kids through college and private school. Mm -hmm. and I mean, I, I, it's like, I can't imagine anyone ever even thinking about trying to do that. I mean, you know. Uh, it, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, our, the way our society has evolved, yes. that, that would be completely unthinkable. Yes. So, I mean, for me, I remember my first year of teaching was like, Jesus, I'm making a whole lot more money than my dad ever made, you know? Yeah. Uh, actually, I worked at a factory one summer um, when I was in college. And I remember I wound up with getting overtime because they would just stick you on the line and you do all this stuff. And of course, you didn't have time to do it right and you get it wrong. Uh -huh. And then, again, you know, but about the end of the week they come in they said hey we got all these cars that are you know buses actually weren't done right would you like to make some overtime i said sure so they took me in and all the buses that i had done wrong <laughs> <laughs> they were paying me two and a half instead of just simply <laughs> having somebody you know like let's sit by this guy for 20 minutes totally you know? right oh you know? so um so i remember getting that first paycheck and going like wow you know I'll be working as a professional, as a, as a teacher or whatever I do. Uh -huh. And I probably won't see another paycheck like this for 10 years. Yeah. And I think it was for like probably $160 or something. Wow. So, um, so, you know, even at teaching, you got paid well, but you wound up with three months where you weren't working. Right. Um, so, right. You, you know, it's, it's like uh, you could take a vacation. Um, which, and not eat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was living in my parents' house at the time. Okay. So All right. Was, you know, I was a comic book fan. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Um, so, um, but I mean, I certainly spent the summers working on drawing, doing stuff like that. And, wow. You know, uh, and whatever. So. When do you think you got like consistent work then? So was sh shortly into your career or do you Fairly think quickly. Okay. I mean, I mean, I had the same experience in comic books that I had in doing storyboards and mm -hmm. animation. It's um, when I when I moved out here, I started going around to the studios and looking for storyboarding work, and they all went, "Yeah, nice stuff. You know how to draw, you know how to do this, but uh, you've never really done storyboards before, so you know we'll we'll call you or whatever." And you know that went on for you know four or five interviews, and finally at Marvel they were so busy, the guy said. Hey, look, we'll bring you in and we'll use you as an apprentice. And he goes, look, we really don't have anybody we can put you with. So we'll bring you in. We'll give you a desk and give you a script and have somebody work with you. And when wow. you have the desk, um, how about if we just give you a script and you take it home and you do it? So, wow. I, you know, so I went, okay. So I mean, I was living in LA then. Yep. So I you know, got the script, took it back and he looked at it and went, wow, this is great. You're hired. You know, I mean, it's just like, you know, I had a job Unreal. the next day. Well, as soon as I got that job at Marvel, I got calls from Hanna Barbera, um, <laughs> or whatever else, going like, because um, my name appeared on Union Rolls. It's like, oh, you're a new storyboard artist. You know, we could, you know, we were looking for new people. You know, and I'm thinking like, you know, I'm the same guy that two weeks ago were like, unreal. So, um, yeah, it, as I said, animations time. They'd already had experience with comic book people, and they thought 
they draw well, but they really don't know how to do the movie stories. And again, for me, I grew up watching movies, so I understood continuity and, sure. and like that. But but anyway, the the experience in comic books was very similar. Whereas like I would bring my work, work around and nobody was like, oh, you know, it's nice. You need to work on this, you know, and, you know, and, and uh, I remember Joe Lando, who was eventually my editor, when I was showing him my portfolio one time, he goes, you know, your stuff's not bad, but come here, look at this. And he shows me, uh, what's his name? Garcia Lopez's work. Ooh. He goes, look, he said, the reality is, if you want to work in this business, you got to be this good. And I knew who Garcia Lopez was. Sure. And my thought was like, wow, <laughs> we're going to have to fire half of the staff. to both Yeah, both right. Them. No joke. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot but, compare no, yourself. No way. No was, again, just trying to, to say, you know, this is not an easy road to take. Mm. Um, but like I said, and, and even when I got work, that was the first thing that occurred to me is like, you're not drawn like Harvey Garcia Lopez, you know. Wow. Uh, so, uh, How long later you- when I told him, I told him that story. He thought it was pretty funny. So. He's so humble though too, right? He's yeah. just this chill yeah. and, and just, you know, he's like, but, no, no, thank you, thank you. And, you know, I just, I love that about him. He's not, whereas like someone like Neil Adams is very, you know, pomp and, you know, he, he, he owns it and I appreciate that, but. And, and Neil, for me, um, while I never was a great fan of the work, so to mm. speak, what I admired about Neil was how much he did to bring the status of comic book artists up. Yes. And as a guy like me, I would go into New York. Mm-hmm. Neil opened up the studio to anybody who, you know, it was always, come on in, sit in the back room, schmooze, talk with the guys. Yep. And I mean, that was just invaluable. Um, and he would give you criticism. and. Um, uh, it was much tougher than the editors. Yeah. So yeah, I can uh, see he has a critic's eye for sure. Yeah, but um, but but like I said, once I got my first couple of assignments, and you could walk in and instead of saying, you know, no, I've never done this, you know, I mean, you know, this, this these are my samples. You could say, yeah, I've been working at Gold Key. I, you know, oh. I'm gonna work at Charlton. You know, I've done store. You know, once word got out that you were working for somebody suddenly you became something to steal yeah you know, it was, wow it was, it was there's a hot new artist working at at uh, at marvel or there's a hot new artist working at dc didn't matter if you were hot or not yeah what right hey was, hey there's a new artist your new you blood know, let's yep. get him in and you know so we so we make sure we don't let somebody slip by how long um, would it take you to do a page well let's see i was um I'm trying to compare that to you as a teacher because I'm a teacher now. So. Or 25 then, so it took me 25 years. <laughs> I, you know, it, it depends. Okay. If you're drawing a page of the Russian army invading Europe. Right. You know, it's going to take you a week. If you're drawing a page of six talking heads, um, not very long. I mean, I remember Kubert again, uh, just telling me one time, because we're, you know, with like, the guy at the time was like, you know, it was like you had uh, Neil Adams and then you had guys like, like Basema and, and Kubert, you know, and, and it was like, yeah, you know, I, I turn out the page in 45 minutes and, you know, whatever. And, and Neil was like, well, I've spent all the morning penciling these first three panels. And, yeah. Oh. And Kubert went, no, he said, if you really look at what Neil's doing and you look at what, you know, what everybody else doing, he goes, if you take the best, you know, the slowest guy out there and the fastest guy out there, uh-huh. he said, there's probably not an hour's difference between the amount of time it takes him to turn out a page. You know, it's just that. And, and John Basema uh, gave a, uh, um, a seminar, you know, lecture one time on comics, and he gave this succinct advice. He went, learn how to draw better, and then you can draw faster. So and, true. Oh, and, wow. and I mean, and it's, it's like, wow, when I yeah. made the animation. I'd, I'd constantly run into artists that go like, oh man, I don't know if I keep up with the schedule, you know, uh-huh. you know, got to draw to draw these frames. Well, for me, it was like coming out of comics. It was like, this stuff is really easy to draw. <laughs> <laughs> You're not taking it to that finished level. Mm-hmm. And, and the other thing for me was um, fairly early. I got into, um, you know, um, trying other things in art. Like I, I started out in watercolors, yep. photography. So you were, you were things, but um, uh, fairly early I got into, uh, 
keeping a sketchbook. So, I mean, it was, it was, it was like, you know, every week, um, I'd be going in and, uh, Oh my God, this is incredible stuff. I mean, well, just looking at your studio tells a story and looking at these, Oh my God, this is amazing. Um, the, the two things that really happened to me after I was into comics and I, you know, I was established for whatever work that meant, mm. um, and didn't mean anything. Yeah. Uh, the two things that really made a difference in my career in terms of getting me to the next level mm. was one, when I, um, shortly after I moved out here, uh, Chaikin moved out here too. Mm -hmm. And we got together cause you know, we were buddies in New York at the, and, uh, um, he said, Hey, I'm going to do some more American flags. You interested in uh, penciling them? Sure. And it was like, it was like, for me, it was like, sure. Cause I'd been doing animation for about a year yep. and that business goes up and down, up and mm -hmm. down. And so it was like, cool. I can get some comic book work. So I make sure I got stuff to tide me over in case, um, you know, the, um, uh, um, animation is starting to slow down again. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, I shared a studio with, with Howard for two or three years. And, um, what he taught me about basically, uh, a little bit about drawing, but a lot about design and, um, um, storytelling, uh, and, and just kind of a professional approach to things that, uh, Howard's big thing was artists were telling like, you know, I want to be a comic book artist. And he went, no, 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 you don't. You want to be an artist yes. who has comic book uh, editors as clients. Yes. And so, I mean, that's kind of what, what uh, Howard was great for instructing me at was like, you're a good comic book artist. Here's how you can take your step, you know, your, your, you know, here's how to take the, the, the work a step further. Um, his, his knowledge of graphics was just, you know, it was great. Um, and, you know, his, his, his uh, storytelling, um, like I said, he was just, um, the best guys I knew in comics did both. They were writers and artists. Um, and mm -hmm. I certainly, like I thought Howard was, was easily the, the best guy of my generation in terms of writing, drawing, and doing comic books. I mean, uh, nobody was doing anything like American Flag. That was just, well, I think, I, I think your American flag, I like that of your art. If I were to compare that to anything else you've done, that might be my favorite, maybe because it's not superhero. Yeah. Right? Like that, you're definitely telling a story there. That's a movie. American flag, your artwork is absolutely a movie. We're going to sure. come back to this a little later because I have to ask you another question. But okay. Um, uh, and, and I like flag quite a bit. The problem with it was that um, you're doing it in the shadow of Howard. So no matter yeah. what you do, yeah, it's, it's always, you know, you're following. You're going to compare him. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and secondly, Howard had a way of doing things and, and I liked it, but it was like, uh, and, and Vinnie Coletta explained this to me fairly early. It was like, look, if you want to be successful in this business, you better get to be your own man. Yeah. And you know, it, it's like, you know, get your own style and, and, and sure. he goes as a penciler, nobody's ever going to pay much attention to you. You know? Um, so, I mean, that was, hmm. I mean, there was a point where like, well, like with Howard and myself, I'd learned pretty much what I could from him and it was kind of time, you know, to, to move on. And again, at that point he had, kind of moved into uh writing television and stuff that's right um and I, you know i was doing you know moved into to comics or whatever um but like i said that was a big help for me the second thing was um about uh, about the time i finished up working with uh with Jake and um i belonged to an organization out here called caps which is california uh, artist professional society and it's like Sergio and Scott Shaw and um, trying to, a couple of mm -hmm. guys started it. Um, and one of the guys was Bill Stout, who had his weekly uh, Bill stuff you've seen in movies. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, um, uh, he's a premier dinosaur artist. He's a naturalist. Mm. Um, you know, he's, he's one of the guys who spent six months in Antarctica. I'm drawing, writing this down to look him up. Yeah. Uh, uh, doing uh, paintings of uh, 
you know, in Antarctica. If you go to the San Diego Museum of uh, 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 Natural, or, you know, um, uh, uh, Natural History Museum, uh -huh. he's done the murals there. Um, but anyway, Bill has, has hosted a life drawing class on Sundays. And, um, you know, I asked for an invitation and started going there. And so I spent the next 25 years just every Sunday doing uh, life drawings. You still do. I see your posts all the time. You're still doing quite a bit. Well, we took a year off for some reason. You did. You did. Yes. Uh, you know, in fact, just we had our first class something. Just, uh, just a week ago. Yeah. And it's like, A, drawing, you know, drawing from the model again was perfect, but also like just being with this group. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, you never... You got, you got, you sit next to guys who are like, you know, basically, a, you know, they're trying to make their way through art school. And the next guy you sit through is like somebody like Dan Guze, who did, you know, all the movie posters with Drew Struson, you know, uh -huh. like, oh, okay. Um, so, um, but going to those drawing classes, um, or I, they're not classes, they're actually just a workshop. Mm. Uh, it really, you really learned about drawing. I mean, mm. just doing it and, and, so, I mean, it's like I was drawing figures all the time. Well, I got into a point where like, well, that's nice. But I, I would start out the day, I would set up a still life. Uh, maybe it'd be something like, uh, uh, you know, in this case, uh, I'd go out in the backyard and I'd draw a cactus. Yep. Uh, wow. I mean, you know, sometimes, uh, and I would often take whatever the model was that I had the week before, I would do a background behind her of, of like, okay, there's my neighbor's chimney. You know, you just, um, you're looking for things to draw, um, you know, empty gin bottle. I got that from my neighbor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, you know, stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, it's like, this is just stuff in my studio with, you know, old, old pieces of wood, brushes, whatever. Do you need to find inspiration or it just comes to you? I don't know what inspiration necessarily, I mean, inspiration. To draw, like, so like you, you just, you start a page, you know, some reasons ask, what do I draw? I'm like, look out the window and draw. Look yeah. at your desk and draw, draw. That's all I Living say. in the world is your inspiration. Yeah. Um, and for me, let's face it. I'm a 73 year old hypochondriac. If I don't draw, I'm there going, Wait a minute, what's that? You know, uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's like, I need something to fill the time. Um, so I love to draw, but drawing also keeps me, you know, keeps me busy. Yes. A hundred percent. I feel that, especially during the pandemic, a hundred percent for me. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I got busy with grad school and all that, but if there's any downtime, I've got to do something. And yeah, drawing is just, I love, I think it started like back in school when we had our, our notebooks, right? We would just start to pencil in the, the margins or whatever. Uh -huh. It just keeps on going, right? Well, I mean, that's the other thing for me is, is like, you know, I take this book to drawing class, but I also have two other sketchbooks of different, you know, one a little smaller size that I keep in my car mm -hmm. and one like this size that I keep in my pocket. So when I take a walk in the morning. Yes. I'm, you know, it's like, I don't do it very often, but it's like, if I see something that's like, oh, that's cool, I can stop yep. and draw it. Or when you're out and about and you've got like, okay, I got the doctors, it's going to be 15 minutes before I see them. Sure. You know, I can do a little sketch or I'm oh, sitting, sure. I ordered food and it's going to be 10 minutes. I mean, people always tell me, I wish I had time to draw. And the thing is like, you got all the time in the world, just, you know, keep paper and pencil handy. And Absolutely. You, um, you know, whatever. Do you ever do digital or do you still like uh, the feel of pencil on paper? Um, well, I, I, I was going to say, I guess you can't see it with the, uh, but uh, yeah. Hey, my, oh, that's uh, beautiful. You know, I started, I probably got a whole digital setup in 1992. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I was working on Tales in the Crypt at the time. And I can remember I invested about I think it was like eighteen or twenty thousand dollars in graphic equipment because you needed you know you needed your your printer your scanner and all this sure. stuff. Sure. About four or five years later, it was all out of date, so I had to replace it. Yep. I think I replaced the I replaced everything for about four thousand dollars. Yeah. That, the only thing that hadn't gone down in price were the uh, Wacom tablets. Mm -hmm. Printers. I mean, 
what you get for a seventy dollar printer now. I remember paying twenty eight hundred dollars for absolutely. it. Absolutely. Oh my god, absolutely. So, um, and unfortunately. I've never been able to draw digitally. I do all my coloring, lettering, mm. all of, all those things. I do all Same. that digitally. Same. Um, but the drawing for me always looks a little bit like a recovering stroke victim because the line is. You know, I feel like I've done it with my left hand or something. Still, all these years. What's made the difference for me, though, this is my uh, product uh, endorsement here. Let's see if I can find it. is another friend in animation show me the uh, ipad pro uh -huh. and he's drawing with the side of the pencil when he's when he's on it i'm like wow mm -hmm. because that's also one of the things that really slowed me down is like i draw on the side of the pencil most of the time now and uh -huh. you can't do that on a computer you know you yeah. have to use the, the point of the stylus absolutely um and also it's you know it's light enough I can use this thing like a tablet of paper. I can turn it. I can do whatever. Sure. Um, and somebody has come up with this neat little thing now where you can, you know, insert it right into this, uh, you know, so you've got your own little drawing pad if you want. That's to all right. It. So, I mean, um, that I swear by now. And, um, you know, on Instagram, I, I post a lot of uh, still lifes that I do. And they're amazing in that, when you use the iPad Pro, when you're done with them, you've got a little video of your work. Yep. So you can take your, you know, for as for a demonstration, it's absolutely perfect. Yep. yep. I'm going to, I'm getting a little hoarse here. So I'm going to like Please that. go for it. We're going to rewind. So, okay. okay. Um, we're going to go to the 70s and 80s. You started with Ms. Marvel but the book was canceled. Do you remember you did like a couple of issues and you would have done the first official published appearance of uh, Rogue who be goes on to become one of the huge X-Men, but the book gets canceled and the story gets published many years later. What happened with Ms. Marvel? Did you, were you expecting big things from this or was this like a book that was just kind of? It was, it was the latest assignment. Yeah, okay. I, mean, I liked, I liked doing Ms. Marvel. Um, I'm trying to think what I had been doing. I mean, the other thing I did in my career was I hopscotched back and forth between Marvel and DC. Well, right. I, I'm rewinding because, you know, I think maybe before I said She-Hulk was my first book, I probably because I enjoyed it the most. Here, I'm going to share the screen. But I rem remember the book Starfire. It didn't last very long. It was part of the DC implosion. Um, You did that. And then, yeah, you kind of flip flop back to Marvel and you were kind of doing I got the same book here. Hey, all right. <laughs> you were kind of going, you were kind of doing, almost felt like you were doing DC Marvel at the same time. Probably not, but they were getting published around the same time, right? Um, yeah, Starfire was actually, Starfire, and I did this other book, this terrorist book called ISIS. ISIS. Oh, God, that's right. From the TV show, correct? Uh, right. Yep. Um, those were my first, I think probably the first regular assignments I was doing were some Shang-Chi stories. Mm-hmm or the black and white books. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, then I switched over to DC and I was doing uh, Starfire and Isis. Um, and then I, I came back to Marvel for a while. Um, yeah, this story was interesting because uh, um, I did the story for, uh, for Milgram for his Fanfare magazine. Um, and um, Chris did the first, you know, um, uh, the first installment right. and I was really excited because this was the first time I got to ink my own work. In fact, they didn't, they didn't realize that because apparently they didn't put in the ink or anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they were still trying to figure that out. Um, so I was really excited about like, good, this book will come out and people can actually see that I can ink my work too. Well, what happened is the story got put on the shelf and didn't come out for like seven or eight years. Seven or eight like, years, exactly. Great. And I mean, and, and it was like another six or seven years before Chris got around to doing the second plot. I went, well, oh, okay. You know, yep. uh, I was working in animation, I think then. And I, I did that. Um, and I did a third one, but you know, by that time I was working a regular job in animation, which is like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm, you know, right. Uh, and um, I think Mike uh, Gustavich did it. Who was another guy from Michigan. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, 
because he did he did a couple of pages in between it was like your pages then his pages and then that's yeah. right um so okay you've done starfire ms marvel and then shortly after you go into she hulk savage she hulk which is where i come in and i just was blown away i don't know i mean again i love the incredible hulk but something about she hulk i just really struck with me talking about inkers you went through quite a few inkers in 25 issues um, did you have a favorite? Did you get to pick who was inking your work? How did it work? I mean, I do. I think I actually prefer your inking, you inking your own stuff. Um, the only inking of She-Hulk I got to do was in the 25th issue. That's right. The final issue. That's oh, right. Stuff. And, and yes, I was my favorite inker. Uh, no, I was not my best inker. You, know, you don't think so? Well, eventually, yes. Okay. But, but um, you did in Cloak and Dagger. You inked your own stuff. Right. I inked my own stuff in Cloak and Dagger. And yes. I was never blown away by, uh, you know, uh, by that stuff. Um, I liked it, but it was, uh, uh, it got a little rough. The Cloak uh, and Dagger stuff? Yeah. Um, I, it, it was, it was, it was strange have. working for a... Um, one of the problems with inking in comics was you couldn't work too fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, because uh, they were doing them on plastic uh, uh, sheets, you know, plastic, uh, uh, what do they call those, um, that they would print with. Okay. So, you know, after about a half million or, you know, like three or 400,000 copies, the plastic would start to, on the finer lines would wear out and you'd start to get these squiggly little lines. Mm. So, um, so I tried to keep the stuff a little bolder and then discovered like, Oh, they're not using that process anymore. So, oh, you, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, I'm doing this stuff and then I'm looking at guys like Sinkevich and, uh, yes. and uh, the younger guys are all doing these delicate pen things. And um, so it was like, uh, um, it was fun stuff to do. I loved working with Terry uh, as a writer. You had been friends beforehand. Well, like I said, we've known each other, you know, long before then. So, and he has a very whimsical sense of, of, of storytelling, which I love. I, I, I like the stories because they were very oddball in their own way, but there was a lot of heart between the characters. Um, and I, I remember the issue where um, Dagger's blind and she's learning how to, um, Just give me to navigate second. with the cane. Uh, my real job here is to let the cat in and, <laughs> and uh, you know, all this stuff is secondary. I got my, my yeah. all you want, but I'm first. <laughs> no, I, I, I've got two and I, I, exactly. They definitely rule the roost here for sure. Wow. Um, I remember, do you remember the issue where uh, Dagger's learning how to work, work the cane? She's blown. Oh yeah. Yeah. I yeah. love that. So, I mean, you know, again, I was probably what, nine or 10 reading that. And I just remember like, and again, not it wasn't any big superhero drama whatsoever, but it was you and Terry showing us how people learn how to operate a cane and how they hear sounds and um you know that's fascinating, you know, just because I'm thinking like I was talking about going to movies as a kid. Yeah. Of course, we always went to this little theater in Rochester, Michigan. And at the beginning of every movie, they always showed a trailer for the Rochester School for the Blind, uh, for huh. seeing eye dogs. Sure. It was it was one of the the three or four places in America where they taught seeing eye dogs how to you know take people around or whatever. So I mean, it was like I saw that every week. Like, mm -hmm, cool, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. So, <laughs> so I, uh, thought, I thought it was so cool how you guys were incorporated. Okay, so um, Ms. Marvel, Starfire, then She Hulk. What was it like having like a lead? Uh, female superhero in, in comics because they weren't really particularly popular back then, right? Well, neither was I. So I mean, um, it wasn't. It wasn't like I went from doing the X Men to She Hulk. Okay. Um, I mean, for me, it was like, great. It's it's a good job. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pays the bills, um, and again. I'm still living in um, in Michigan at the time. Wow. Uh, so um, it was difficult to, uh, you know, not being in the office, 
you were kind of out of sight, out of mind. Sure. And um, I had switched over from DC to Marvel. And in the process, I managed to annoy um, Vinny. Coletta, uh, yep. Because, I mean, like, he had inked my books and he'd always done, you know, a fantastic job in terms of taking stuff that I did and, and adding something to it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, one of the problems with Vinny was a, like, you know, if, if he was going to Neil Adams, he wasn't going to add to Neil. It was, you know, it was going to, you know, uh -huh. uh, but a guy like me, I'm, I'm coming in, he knew how to slick stuff up and, and add stuff to it. It, was, it looked great. Yeah. And he was also the art director. And I, I would try and explain to him that like, you know, I really want to ink my own stuff. Mm -hmm. And he'd be like, well, yeah, you don't know how to do it yet. You know, whatever. Um, so eventually I left, you know, uh, DC and I went to work for Marvel. And the first thing was like shooter starts this thing called team America or something. Yes. And he tells me about it. And we want you to do it. And I'm like, yeah, cool. Cool. And he goes, well, you know, who would you like to, to ink it? And, um, of course, I'm sitting in his office. I'm just, you know, it's like, like, you know, young and glib and stupid. And I'm going, mm -hmm. well, anybody but Vinny. And unbeknownst to me, Vinny had just been hired. That's right. At, 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 at Marvel and yeah. as art director. And he was like uh, right. Jim's yeah. best buddy. <laughs> yep. and like my stock at Marvel at that point went. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, um, so She-Hulk for me was kind of, uh, I'm real happy to do it, but I'm sure it was for, for Jim and everyone else, which was like, stick them on that book and get, you know, just, you know, um, we can use them for that. But I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like they were trying to figure out what to do with me. What were the sensors like? Because She-Hulk's outfit is basically a torn blouse, right? You're allowed to show a little bit of cleavage, but like you got her leaping around the, of LA, right? She's either, you know, she's battling villains in a, in a dress, like, did you find that complicated or I mean? No, it never occurred to me okay. that there was any censorship to be perfectly honest. Interesting, okay. I mean, I'm sure in the office, someone you know, might say to, uh, to one of the inkers, um, change, change the cleavage here a little bit or, or you know, whatever. And, and, sure. But I mean, that was, that was um, adolescent stuff, you know, it's like, yes. Uh, you know, I'm gonna draw nickel, nipple bumps on. You know, <laughs> right, right, you know, like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. You know, you can't do that kid. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure Marvel would have loved it if I had, had drawn her sexier than I did. I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, we were, I thought you did draw her pretty sexy. I mean, did you, were you inclined to make her sexy or is it just natural? I mean, all your women from, from She-Hulk Dagger to Ms. Marvel, Starfire. Um, See, let me interject here. Please. If you were drawing a male superhero. Yes. Would he look like Arnold Stang? Right. That is. So, you know, I mean, you know, would he look like a 98 pound weakling? He's like, no, right. he's a superhero. He That's should have lots of muscles. He should have, you know, he should have, you know. So, I mean, if you're going to draw the Savage She Hulk or right. any Marvel heroine, you don't want her looking like Roseanne Barr. You want her <laughs> right. looking like, you know, like a, a um, you know, a beautiful goddess. Yes. So, I mean, that's what I was being paid to do was, was like, um, you know, God, I love Jack Kirby stuff when I was a kid. I mean, you know, I, I love those comics, but I never saw it. The only, the only women I ever saw in a Jack Kirby comic that I actually went, mm, that's nice, was when Wally Wood inked them. Mm -hmm. uh, but normally the women were like, wow, you know, um, it just, you know, it, it's, it's like his specialty was drawing men in action and stuff like that. And, and uh, um, the girls were kind of secondary. For me, it was the other way around. It was it was like you know I was much more interested in drawing uh, women and and figures. And again, that's why Bill Stout's class made such a big difference was because I was drawing from magazines mm. and you know and and what observations you had just walking around. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you know it's like drawing a figure every week for two or three hours. You really learn how they work. You don't learn the names of the muscles, but you learn where they're at and what they're doing, you know, and right, right. And, and while there's differences between men and women, the figure works in the same way, you know, mm -hmm. it's, 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 um, 
So, um, how did you go from She Hulk to GI Joe? Was that was that like a prime assignment, or was that like another like oh god, we'll just give him this? One book ended, and they needed somebody to fill in on it. Yep. And you know anybody who was in the comics didn't want to draw GI Joe. Sure. Um, it was. I mean, it was. It was like um, you want to keep working at Marvel. We'll give you GI Joe. You know. Wow. I mean, and I was. It was like if somebody gave me a choice, I would have went. Are you kidding? Um, you're yeah. aware though you have fans of this book right like you and Larry Hama the people really this book has just got a cult following oh I'm super aware of that now yeah. but when I was doing the book we had readers but we didn't have fans um, oh I mean, you okay. know I, I would get my art back from one of these books mm -hmm. uh, you know I'd get I, you know I'd get my art and you'd go to convention and there were always fans there that wanted to buy your work yeah and, um, you know, this again, this is back, back when the eighties. So, I mean, you know, a good price for, uh, you know, if I was doing a comic book page was like, you know, uh, 35 to, to 60 bucks. That was like, that was a great, uh, price for selling an original. If you had a GI Joe page, you know, five or $10 was the maximum. You could hope that anyone would pay for it. Unreal. Oh, cause, cause I mean, all the readers were little kids. Sure. Yeah. Um, now, my, my brother loved the book. I read it when I saw your art because I love your art. My brother loved G.I. Joe, though. You're absolutely right. Yep. I remember I was telling you uh, yesterday when we were talking, it was like mm. most of the art from the book, I either gave away to kids, you know, who dropped by the house and whatever, or, um, you know, I sold like, you know, 10 pages to somebody for five bucks a piece, something like that. Um, now, when I see the, the, you know, the prices of those, I'm always just like, Oh no, oh my God, you know. Um, and, but the same thing is true of, of you know, I, I look at like stuff that I did for Marvel and I thought, man, that's pretty ordinary stuff, you know. Um, and I might have gotten, you know, a, 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 you know, selling it at a convention at the time, like $25, $30, and thought, oh, good, I've been a good week, you know. Um, now it's, it's like it goes from $250 to, to $1,500 for a page uh -huh. of just anything because it was done in Marvel at that time period. That's right. You know, it, it's... Um, what was Marvel like in the early 80s, early to mid 80s? I couldn't tell you very much because I yeah. wasn't there. That's right. I mean, um, you know, um, in fact, I was looking at my She-Hulk stuff just, you know, so I'd be a little familiar with it. And I'm looking, I'm realizing mm -hmm. like, well, Al was the editor of this. He was. And, and I remember, oh, yeah, he was the editor. But I mean, it wasn't like I'd get on the phone with Al every week and talk about like, well, what do you think in this issue? I mean, it was like, here's the stuff. It's due on the 15th. Get it in. You know, I mean, that was, that was kind of the routine. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like I said, this would have been interesting talking with Dave because I don't think I ever, maybe I had three or four conversations with him in the entire time we worked together. Um, I, cause I lived in, 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 uh, Michigan, he lived at Screamer Mountain, Georgia. That's right. So we certainly never met and, and, um, I would get the stuff and it'd be pretty straightforward. The, um, the um, Masterworks has actually, you have the Masterworks, right? The Savage Hope, they have, um, they have a letter that you had written him or posted. I, and it was interesting to see. Oh yeah. He, he had I've like. Got, Oh, wait, in the She-Hulk? Yeah. Okay, I've got volume two. Yeah. So it's probably in, is it volume two or volume one? Let me see, let me see. Um, it might be volume one. At the end, yeah, I think it is, yeah. Um, you know, I'll scan some of them. It's got, um, it's got like uh, Dave's original notes and then there's a letter, there's like some of your sketches and then or maybe it's not your skip. Yeah, it's some of your um, layout thumbnails, and then right. Yeah. Um, oh, it's from him to you. Uh, I closed all the thumbnails for. Oh, yeah. This is what you wrote him, August eighteenth, seventy nine. Dave enclosed all the thumbnails for She Hulk number two. I don't know how much you'll be able to pick us pick up from these drawings, as they are pretty rough. But at least you can get a general idea of how approach how approaching your story. I'll be finished with the pencils about the 27th of the month and i'll be starting at number three right after that peace mike p.s if you have any comments give me a call and i just thought oh wow that's they had to write letters and they had to 
nail stuff. To PS, yeah. your penmanship's fabulous. There was a, a hot new invention then called the fax. A fax. I remember my father had one. Yep. <laughs> and lowly comic artists couldn't afford one of those. Right. Yeah. Like, oh. But that was I mean, a big thrill. Your, your, your layouts and your thumbnails, your original art. Ah, it's beautiful stuff. You know, they never sent me a copy of that book. Really? Yeah. I'll do, uh, yeah. Uh, I've got the second one. I mean, Marvel would usually send me stuff, but for some reason, they never sent me that one. Um, I so. actually think I have another copy. I'll send you the second copy. All right. I because I want you to have one. I it, it's I mean it's just fun for the nostalgia, but the, the yeah. I love the extra stuff. Looking at your thumbnails and stuff. Oh man. So I mean it I was about it that. Was, like I said, that was about the amount of involvement um, that you got. I mean, you just didn't have editors didn't have time to talk to you. Right. And for the most part, it was like, what am I going to tell him? You know? Um, and I mean, cause, cause uh, you're wrapped up in the day to day. Got to do this, got to do this, got to do this. And especially someone like Al, who's also is an editor and I'm freelancing. So. Yeah. Um, Were you stressed about deadlines? Were deadlines like, like, I mean, that's why I always said I'm never going to do comics. I could never do a monthly book. I work way too slow. I am too meticulous. And the only travel book I had problems on, uh, with the deadline was probably um, um, G.I. Joe mm -hmm. towards the end, just because it was just like, uh, you know, 17 new characters, uh, the, you know, it just, it just wore me out. And that, that's and, an ultimate team book. Cause there were so many characters in that book. Um, and it and wasn't, it wasn't a deadline thing. It was a psychological thing. Sure. Yeah. It was, it was um, Hey, for a book like that, and then like even like She-Hulk, you created you created a lot of original characters, monsters, uh, mechanical uh, enemies, nemesis. I mean, how, where does that come from? Did you have any kind of like was some of it Ed kind Hannigan, of probably? <laughs> what, what was that? I said Ed Hannigan. I mean, usually if there was a new, um, you know, like like a lot of the villains in She-Hulk, I think probably somebody like Ed would come up with a character sketch of this is what we want him to look like, and I would. Okay go off that or uh gi joe uh, a lot of the covers you'd get like a rough idea from ed and you you know finish you you take it to a finish mm -hmm. so i mean you know he'd work out the ideas so i mean it was a it was a collaborative things like that yeah. okay so and, and then all right another i'm looking at my slides here let me show this another female centric book was i mean i think you and i talked about it on the phone i'm like do you guys show up a babe artist and you're like wait what's that I guess because you did, you did Sisterhood of Steel, which is a great book by uh, right. you and Christy Marks. How yep. did that come about? Um, changed my life. Uh, no, A, um, I was working, you know, like I said, I wanted to ink my own books and uh, Marvel started the Epic line mm -hmm. uh, so that you could, you could do your own characters, you know? And so as soon as that happened, uh, I had an agent at the time, uh, Mike Friedrich, um, and he hooked me up with Christy and said, hey, you know, she's a writer and she's looking for an artist. Uh, can I, you know, um, can I pitch you two together for a series? And that was Sisterhood of Steel. Yeah. And um, Christy was somebody that as soon as I started on the book, we had a lot of creative interaction in terms of this is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm doing. Mm. And oddly enough, um, you know, Annie and I had just uh, been married. And your wife, and yep. My wife. And we were talking about moving to California. And Christy, of course, lived out here. And so I said, well, let me go out and visit. So I came out and she's living in this sleepy little town of Tahunga, which is actually a part of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, but it's a northern, I always say it's the northernmost little finger that sticks up, you know. Um, so, um, so, you know, I came out here, got together with her. We talked about what to do with the book and, and so on and so forth. And she was always very instrumental in terms of, of like coloring. I want, you know, I want these things and whatever. So, I mean, we mm -hmm. really talked about stuff, costumes. Um, this again, is his own miniature movie. I mean, this could be a series. Well, you have to understand is that Christy's background is um animation right uh she basically she was miss hasbro that's I mean, what i thought created, yep. 
or developed all of the Gem series and the G.I. Joe series. That's, That's right. how I wound up doing G.I. Joe animation was through okay. Christy. She introduced me to so many people. But again, this was my um, sketchbook for... Um, Hold that up higher, will you? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. okay oh, so I mean, wow. Like, these were, were some of the quick little sketches I was using for... Um, uh, You know, oh wow i mean i was just doing like like lots of this stuff in terms of okay what should they look like um wow mike do you remember a few years ago you surprised me with a package you sent me the color separations for the series do you remember that did. you did and i still use those for lessons with my students good yeah oh it's beautiful stuff a whole stack of them here too that i mean it's like I, I remember no I one is ever her. interested in, in those things for uh, actually get me the uh, she hope uh, off the wall it's um down by the closet and the far hall door closet um you sent me an original i just got it reframed because i got a kind of good frame but i just moved and i was like ah, i don't know so I, I think you saw i posted on facebook that you had sent me a an original she hope drawing and the color separations for sister and then i had to find the book and pulled the book out and i rewrite it again and i thought man that's such a great book <laughs> it really is. So, yeah, That's so, what I so hope this we'll get more noted. Was just was just filled with, I, you know, like at the time I was working in animation. Yeah. So, you know, I'd finished the work at, uh, um, or actually, no, I, I, this was before I got into animation, but I, I had time. I was really doing a lot of, you know, oh, show me that again. Isn't that great? Oh, like okay. I, haven't, still, I haven't taken it out of the package because I don't. I had a spot for it on the wall. I had it up, and then I was like, "Geez, I don't know." I feel like it, it looks awesome. Um, again, I had it framed, and I just I don't know. I've got a couple more over here. I want to get reframed because we just moved. Um, but uh, yeah, shout out to uh, the picture place. They did a really great job. You see yeah, that? Yeah, it's interesting because I'm looking. I'm going. Okay, Barone Way and Sisterhood of Steel and She Hulk. I was using the same model for both of them. That oh, was for like sure. For sure, right? Uh, the bodybuilder. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because so, um, she knew how to look beautiful and sexy at the same, I mean, you know, and, and muscular at the same time. Agreed. So I'll take a picture when I decide. I, I think it's going in the long You had it this week on, online. That's, I was gonna say, that's where I saw it. So Okay, yeah, so, all right. Yeah, okay. Um, we're getting comments on Facebook, uh, YouTube, excuse me. So let me, we got to talk about, so... Um, we got to talk about Tales from the Crypt. Okay. How did you get involved? I, do you think that's probably what you're most known for? Um, I probably had more people see than anything else. Whether I'm known for it or not is another story. I mean, we're getting comments on YouTube asking about Tales from the Tip. What are we talking about? We're going to talk about Tales from the Crypt. How did that come about? Uh, very simple. Uh, Chaykin and I were sharing a studio he was having, uh, you know, uh, pitch meetings with Joel Silver and Joel said, Hey, you're a cartoonist. I got a new show. Would you like to do some covers for me? And Howard in his brash way is going like, I don't do comic book stories you know, anymore, but you know, I, I got a partner. I'll, I'll tell him about it. So we wound up with, with actually what they wanted was they, they wanted us to do some, um, or they wanted me to do some, um, uh, uh, what do you call them? development drawings? Cause they were mm -hmm. shooting an opening and um, um, actually I got a bunch of that stuff here. Um, they were shooting an opening and um, they, they wanted some things like, okay, we're going to have the crypt. We're going to have this and we need to, to have somebody do some pictures of uh, you know, what they think this stuff should look like. So um we did these things. Oh, wow. Which were, you know, basically uh, myself and uh, another artist that was working at the time, Richard Ori, did a lot of the, uh, the finishes on them for me. Insane, wow. And, but the fascinating thing was, before I even started, I said, well, okay. I said, let me do just a quick little idea of, of what you guys are looking for. And I sat down and I, I just did I guess it's like three pages four pages I did a quick little four four page 
scribble thumbnail of, okay, this is what you're talking about for the opening. Thank you. And um, so I, I did these, you know, these pages. And that was just kind of like, that was just kind of thrown in as my little on yap in terms of, okay, this is the way I see this stuff. Well, that was pretty much the way the opening was. I mean, the opening, that's that for shot for shot. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. like, you know, I wasn't even doing storyboard work, work for movies and I'm going like, cool. You know, that's like a great little, uh, you know, just a second. I'll see you in a bit, my sweet. Okay. All right. Um, we say hello. We have to talk about how you landed such a gorgeous wife. You're an artist. I mean, I guess that is. You're a superstar. Oh, yeah, I'm an artist. Uh huh. Yeah. You know what Mr. I mean? like, Suave. Because <laughs> you know? your wife's also an artist, though, but she does. She is now. Okay. Um, my wife was, you know, like anybody growing up in the 50s, it's like, you've got to have talent to be an artist. I don't know <laughs> if you have talent. And it's, it's like, I tell kids all the time, believe me, I didn't have an iota of talent. And it's all, you know, just. It's hard work. Right. So, but um, anyway, back to the crypt. Sorry, yes, um, the crypt, please. So, um, so yeah, so they used that little thing as, as, a, as a storyboard for how we're going to do the, um, and the drawings that I did for the, um, for the opening of the show. And I remember getting a call from uh, the producer at the time going, hey, you got to stop by. We want you to do another, you know, drawing in one of the, the books or whatever. And uh, we're starting to shoot the opening. So we thought maybe you'd like to look at it. And I came by and it was the most surreal experience I've had in terms of, again, I came out of Pontiac, Michigan. The idea of, of doing anything in film is just, well, that's, you know. Uh, so totally unintentional then. Totally What's unintentional. That? You never intended film. That wasn't like your next step. You, you've conquered. Well, comedy. no, I would have. I would have loved to work in film, but how do you get there? Yeah. Because I mean, I, I broke into animation and was like, that's 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 you know that's pretty impressive, you know. And and uh, but at any rate, so they take me to the set, and all these little drawings I'd been doing, suddenly I saw as a three dimensional representative. It was just like. Oh my God, you know, that's incredible. And you know, you have this big brick wall and you go up and touch it and you realize, wait a minute, that's plywood. <laughs> you know, that's, um, and, and two weeks later when I came in, it's gone, you know, but I mean, um, so that was my introduction to, to, um, um, to working in movies. I think that was the first season they had like six shows and they would give me stills, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a couple stills from the show to look at. And, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if they had tapes then of the shows themselves, but um, anyway, that's what I was looking at. And I had to, you know, come up with cover ideas, which I would do. Um, I would do little thumbnail drawings like this, mm. you know, and uh you know, I'd do like five or six of these for each show and show them to them and they would pick one out and then I'd take that to the finish. Um, and um, I think, I thought I had one of those. I, I still have one of those around someplace, but uh, most of that stuff I've, I've gotten rid of over the years. Um, but at uh, any rate, that was just like, it paid like, you know, you were just like, <laughs> you know, cause um, you know, you're used to comics where you're getting, you know, your rate then was probably like for a finished page, pencils and inks, maybe around 300 was tops. Mm. And these were like, Oh, five times that, you know, and, um, and a lot less work because you only had to draw two thirds of the page. Right. Um, but at any rate, I had a great time doing them. And again, my, um, I used Richard Ory. We we had what they had called the uh, the blue line method, which yep. um, I don't know if. if uh, I still use blue, a blue pencil every now and then. Well, blue. Well, a blue line. You shoot a negative. Okay. And then you shoot. Um, you put that on a on a page, and you put your chemical on, and you pull the negative off, and it leaves a blue line. Okay. That matches up with your black line. Got it. Okay. So we would take those and you'd color underneath. It's the way most comics were done in, uh, to get 
that you know that painterly look in the and you know in the late seventies and early eighties. So we that's what that's how we colored the first um, first two or three seasons, and then I moved to you know doing them digitally. How many but, episodes do you think you did? Ninety. One hundred three, I think is. Oh, is okay. The, wow. Yeah. So, um, uh, but what I do remember was I think it was in the start of the second season, maybe the start of the third season, whatever. For I I you know like convinced the. Uh, um, uh, the uh, the producer, I said, you know, probably really would be helpful if I got to go in and kind of sit around the set and take some snapshots of the stories you're doing, and I could give you a much better idea of what I think would work. And he's like, oh yeah, that'd be great, it'd be great. So I mean, it was like, cool, I get to go sit on. A yeah. <laughs> you know? So I mean, and I learned very quickly, like everyone else, the first 15 minutes, you're just, you know, staring out with your mouth open. Right. And after that, you're like, is this ever going to end? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's hurry up and wait. It's, you know, it's just, um, but it was, it was great because over, I mean, that, that show ran for 10 years. So every year they'd say, yeah, we're going to do another 12 episodes. And I would do the math and go, great. That's about three months work. That's going to take me about two and a half weeks to do. Wow. So, I mean, wow. working days. Um, so, and yeah, I did go out to the set and I got to meet everybody that was working at the time, um, you know, in, in terms of, um, uh, you know, who was doing stuff in Hollywood. It's re- it's hard for me to watch a show now, even on TV, where I don't go like, oh, yeah, I remember working with him in a Tales episode, you know, yep. it's just uh, everybody shows up. Um, That's another I mean, show that has such a huge cult following. And it was such a so many rabid fans of that show. Yeah. Um, I mean, like. My, my mom maybe wasn't a fan, but I think she would watch it because my brother, my father, my my myself, we would watch it. I mean, yeah. we loved it. So I think my mom, I think there were some episodes she definitely enjoyed, right? Mm-hmm. But um, interesting so because I always movies. thought they they did really great comedy episodes. Yes. But I wasn't I, I it wasn't like the old, you know, Boris Karloff thriller where they right. had just some right. absolutely, you know, scary stuff, but Right. I'm always amused because I would run into to people and go like, yeah, I, I used to watch that with my dad. You know, I was like six or seven. I'm going, what the hell is wrong with your dad? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> and Because the, the other thing I do remember about him was HBO. So they would shoot one scene sure. for HBO and then they would, you know, put the tops on or do whatever they had to do wow. or you know, change the language and they would shoot the scene again right. for syndicated TV. Sure. Oh, yeah. So they had, you know, they had a second version. So when they got ready to put it on Fox, they had the shows there. They could get back to them again. You know? Unreal. So, I mean, that's how you make money, though. That's incredible. So, um, uh, yes, I, like I said, it was, um, that was absolutely a great job. Um, well, so, and then how did you get into, so is this true? Hold on, let me see if I can share. You did, I said it. No, uh, <laughs> did, you did music, you were storyboarding for music videos as well? Um, did you do yeah. Eve's Eve's blow? Let me blow your mind video. I don't know. Uh, I do remember I did at least two of the Eminem. Yep. Okay. Fan, Stay in the fan and coming out of the closet. Yep. I did a couple of the Fifty Cent ones. How does how did that happen? How did you end up doing storyboarding for music videos? I had an agent who was looking, you know, wanted somebody to do storyboards and um, I'd show up at this guy's place. He's going, yeah, we're doing music videos. And, and um, you know, and that was fun because I'd sit down with him and he would go, look, this is the idea. I'd say, okay. And I, I, I would do the same thing that I, that I did on the, the, yeah. the script. I would do a rough little storyboard in front of him and he'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we would talk our way through the script that way. And there's, you know, sometimes maybe 40 or 50 panels like that. And we wow. get to the end of it and you go like, okay, that's cool. Go home and make those pretty and, and then bring them back. And, uh, you know, it's a couple days work. Mm-hmm. Um, I never went to any of those shoots. Um, but so uh, did you ever like, were you ever like, I want to see it on TV to see if it compares to mine or? Mm, some of them, I, I think I probably have seen. In fact, I probably should go back and watch some of them. Yeah. Um, I do remember one day I walked in and um, 
you know, to talk about the the script. And he goes, Hey, we got to go over to Dre's house. And I'm, I'm just like, huh? <laughs> just, yeah. Uh, and so we go over to, uh, you know, this, this place and I'm sure it was somewhere probably around Inglewood and, you know, in the gated community. Mm -hmm. And what struck me about the afternoon, I mean, it was like, you know, met Dre and he was like, I told him I used to be a school teacher. He goes, Oh yeah, really? Yeah. And uh, uh, so he gave me a hard time about that during the thing. But, but what struck me was like, I, um, meeting him, I was like, wait a minute, this is supposed to be Dr. Dre. I felt like I was visiting the Cosby house, you know, cause like his teenage son comes in and goes, Hey dad, you know, I want to run down to the park and <laughs> do some baskets for a while. Is it okay? He goes, yeah, you know, we'll be back in time for dinner, you know? Yeah. Wow. And, but the best part of that was, you know, like I'm thinking, damn, I got to meet Dr. Dre today. Yeah, so, no one can say, not everyone can say that. That's awesome. I, I, I come home and I, I'm, I tell my wife, I said, you won't believe how I spent the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I was working with Dr. Dre. She goes, yeah, she worked at the LA Zoo at the time and, you know, and whatever. And she said, mm. yeah, I had to give Hugh Hefner and his six girlfriends a tour of the zoo today. And I'm just like, you know, yeah. dropped by my own wife, you know, yeah, right? Wow. So, okay, Mike, we got to talk about your Emmy because you said something I thought was really profound when we talked early in the week. Um, so you won an Emmy award in what year was that? When I was younger. Okay. Um, um, uh, uh, I'm going to look it up. I, I had it written down. 98, 2000, I know somewhere around there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was for the Spawn movie, correct? Spawn TV series. The TV series on HBO as well, on correct? HBO, right. Yeah. Um, what was that like? Now, I thought that was like a big moment. And you're, do you remember what you told me? Um, my whole reaction to that was, yeah. was um, a, I work for HBO. First, you have to understand, if you work for HBO, HBO pushes Emmys. HBO, when I worked on Tales from the Crypt, they were trying to come up with huh. a, a category for best inserts used in a title sequence so they could come up with a way to, you know, nominate the comic book covers for an Emmy, you know. So, I mean, um, when, I, when I worked on the Narnia films, the writers, yes, um, I got to be good friends with them. Um, and uh, a year or two later, they said, yeah, we're working on an HBO movie. I went, oh, good, you win an Emmy next year. And they're going, what are you talking about? You know? And they said, I said, yeah, HBO really pushes that stuff. And sure enough, they won an Emmy for uh, The Life and Death of Peter Sellers. That was um, uh, uh, Christopher Marcus and uh, Stephen McFeely, who, of course, went on to write every big comic book movie that's been done in the past. You know, that's right. The, the Winter Soldier and that's they did, right. uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. And, yep. Um, so, I mean, Winning the Emmy was just like, it was a hoot. I mean, yeah. was, I mean just being nominated for it was a hoot, you know, because it was just like, cool. And, and, and then we won. And it was just like, oh, that's, that's you know, you had the, the statue. But one of the funny things that happened was after, uh, at the end of the, you know, at the award show, I'm walking around with the statue. And I'd have these, these gorgeous women be coming up going like, can I touch it? <laughs> and I'm just like, cool. And I give it to my wife. <laughs> yeah you know, to hang on to. And she's standing there. I swear that three minutes later, you have another group of gorgeous women all coming up to her going, can I touch it? Like, <laughs> oh, it wasn't me then, was it? <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. So, so that was exciting. But then, you know, if, if, if you work in animation, you realize, um, and one of my early experiences, I was working for a guy named Gerard Baldwin. I remember going over to his house and on, on his TV set, he had six mm -hmm. Emmys. You know, it was, it was, it was like, it's not like you're the only guy in Hollywood that ever won one of these before. Okay. And, and I, I jokingly, and, and the other thing for me is I directed two episodes of Spawn. I did, I've directed two animation episodes in my life. I was mm -hmm. a storyboard artist. Right. That's, that's what I like doing. And I won two, two animation episodes in my life and I wound up winning an Emmy, which I thought that was fun. But it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm think that I probably could be the next Orson Welles. You know, it's. Uh, Did you feel like, oh, that's something you should pursue is directing and it just didn't happen or you were like, no, that's oh, not. No, I remember I, I had this absolutely great boss at um, um, at HBO named Catherine Winder, who's, who's just done the uh, 
what's this new series on Amazon Invincibles? Yeah. Animation series. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, after the end of the first season, she got myself, Jennifer, you and Tom Nelson. We were all the board artists. He said, you guys did such a good job doing, you know, um, storyboards. You should move up to directing. I want you all to do, do directing next year. Hmm. And like, you know, cool. And so I did my directing for a year and she went, okay, are you ready to do more next year? And I went, no. I said, you know, basically what I learned as a director was I'm in charge of more stuff that sure. uh, I have no control over. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer, on the other hand, she managed to go on and do movies and was the first uh, female nominated for an Oscar for an animated film for um, uh, Kung Fu Panda 3. So, um, um, and, uh, I noticed but you, you do promote your Emmy, but you don't really, you're very humble about it. And I, I mean, I understand now that, that you say it, it's just sort of, it, 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 it's an accolade, well, but it's You have not, to understand, yeah. after I won that Emmy, it was, it was a retirement gift in animation. Really? I couldn't find work in animation to save my life. I was working hmm. for this ad agency and I'd come in and I was the wrist. In other words, an art director would come over and tell me, okay, we want you to draw us this. And then the art directors, the three or four of them would get together with the head of the companies and they'd go, okay. Um, so we had Joel Silver's uh, assistant came by today and he said, what we're probably trying to do for this. So I think what we're looking for here and I'd be over here listening, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, they were like 10 feet away and they go, so make sure you tell the artist to do that. You know, so, I mean, but I mean, it's like, like for me, I'm excluded from these meetings and I'm going, you're talking to Joel's assistant. I talked to Joel personally all the time when I worked on Tales in the Crypt. Yes. So it was like, it was a very humbling experience to like suddenly, huh. you know, you, you, and, and then they, you know, and they, they were very nice people. I mean, I love the art directors there. Come by and okay, we're going to do this and this. And, um, but it was like, man, someday I should just walk in here and bring my Emmy and set it on the desk while I'm working, you know, because it was like, that would have gotten a, oh my God, you know, it, it's- uh, What do you do with your Emmy? Do you have it in a special spot or? Yeah, it's in a back room someplace, you know. Okay. Um, you know, it's in front of a Bill Sink Sinkevich picture. Hey. You know, just, oh yeah, you know, it's like, you know, like he's been replaced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At last. All yeah. right, let, let's talk about some of your, like, your work. So you've done, you had worked for The Big Two and you did independent stuff. You did Archer and Armstrong for a while. Um, but then you, you went in to do some of your own stuff. I'm going to pull up my slide here. Um, I beat you to it. I get my own. Look at that. Yeah. Here, let me before my I share that. Lori Lovecraft comics. Yeah. How did that, where did the idea for Lori Lovecraft come from? I mean, obviously, if you've read any of these, any of your independent stuff, you love film. Like, there is no denying that Mike Bogsberg doesn't well, love a, film. Uh, Lori Lovecraft did two things. It gave me a chance, you know, where it started from. Every week I would do Tales from the Crypt, and there would be this mm -hmm. hot, young, beautiful actress in it. Mm -hmm. And six months later, you were never going to hear from again, you know? Yeah. And yeah. that was Lori. So, I mean, Lori is like, you know, she's, she's like 23, 24 years old and she's already an old hag, you know, she's too old to really be successful anymore. So um, she becomes a sorceress. She's not any better at that, but you know, it, but it gave me a chance to do my own little movies with yes. and cast all my favorite actors in them. I mean, it's like in that first Lori Lovecraft book, there's Boris Karloff, uh, her love interest is Bob Hope, um, you know, and, and um, so, you know, it was, she's it was kind a, of a screw up, but she's also very endearing, right? Well, um, if you ever watch comedies in the forties, the, the scary comedy was the big thing. Yes. I mean, you know, Bob Hope certainly did, uh, you know, uh, the Cat in the Canary, Ghostbusters, um, you know, there was, there was uh, what Fred McMurray and Murder, She Says, mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, God, you had Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis doing Scared Stiff. I mean, that was, that was the whole thing was um, uh, they did scary stuff and then they brought in comedy to lower the level and, you know, lower the, the, the tension level. And then it would go back. And I just love those things when I was a kid. Um, you know, just uh, uh, who was it? the Bowery Boys were doing, you know, stuff like that. And some of it was real trash. Some of it was absolutely brilliant. Yep. But um, 
so that's what I did with with Lori was I just started to like okay I'm gonna do some some fun movies like that and uh, I think in the second one I had William Powell mm -hmm. um, you know got to put him in it um, the third one was a Hitchcock with Hitchcock and his wife um, and his wife basically turns into the psycho character you know so um, you know and um, uh, what made you decide to do your independent stuff? You're like, no one's going to publish this. I'm just going to do it myself. Or yeah, this was the 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 peak of the independent of 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 the comic book craze. It was right. Diamond and all these guys. Everyone, you know, uh, Image was doing their own books. That's uh, right. All these new comics were, you know, and I had a a, a friend out here who was a, a you know ran his own store and and distributor stuff like that. And he goes, you got to do your own comic. And I'm like, okay. So I, I put together a comic book for him. And in, in the meanwhile, he went on to different things and just, he didn't, he wasn't available to, to be the publisher. So I, you know, um, finished the book up and I started shopping it around. Um, and I think, was it, uh, um, who was the, See, I see Asylum, but that was that it was, was just that came later. I don't. Yeah, um, I was looking for Caliber, um, Caliber Comics was the ones who did the first. That's first right. Two or three issues, um, and then the graphic novels I printed myself. Um, and um, one of the uh, the production assistants on Tales from the Crypt had this boyfriend that was interested in comics, and she said, "You can have to meet my boyfriend." And of course, I met her boyfriend, and and uh, we became you know we're we're really good friends. He, he wound up, that's Pete Ventrella. He wound up writing the series for me and his, you know, he always took the stories to another level. Yeah. You know, in terms of, of there was, he brought in something in his writing that I didn't have in, in the artwork and that I, I certainly couldn't bring in, in my own writing. Um, Pete had, had done his own series for TV about paranormal activity with uh, Dan Aykroyd and someone else. And, um, he produces his own um, videos now. In fact, he's doing this. His kind of masterwork is on uh, the independent, um, the whole field of independence and how they've affected and produced what comics are today and mm. have brought comics into film. Um, you know, so. Huh. Um, so that was the first one I did. And like I said, I, I think we did that for guys probably spent 10 years doing that. And then I decided to do my own uh, detective stories, which were my next favorite thing. I loved reading detective stories and I loved the, you know, the, the black and white films of the forties. So I didn't want to do a straight Hollywood adaptation where you're, you know, like it's 1936, you have to have this car. They were only wearing these shoes. And, right. and I didn't want to do a historical strip. So I created, you know, retro wood, which was, you know, um, you know, and, uh, and I even had the tagline on the back, you know, based on false stories and innuendo. So, I mean, any of the actors, I mean, the first one, it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, who was, who was, um, um, you know, like I said, I had William Powell, you know, brought him back in terms of, like love casting him. And, and, uh, uh, I think I did stories with kind of, you know, like a Marlena Dietrich character and, uh, I just did one recently that was online about, um, uh, uh, um, you know, discrimination in film and how like if you did a, if you did a film about Asians, you had to get a Caucasian actor. Yep. So yep. Um, um, it was about, you know, like the character that plays uh, uh, or the actor that plays Charlie Chan gets killed. And Charlie Chan was actually based on this real policeman in Honolulu. So they wind up having to bring in the real you know, the character that inspired him, I mean, the real policeman to actually solve the case with my detective. Uh, so, I mean, I, 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 it's just great fun doing things. Uh, Mike, do you, plot, that, so do you plot your own books like you would like a regular comic book or how do you, it just, you start penciling it out first and then it just evolves or? Well, that's one of the things I really picked up from Chaikin was how to write a movie script mm -hmm. or how to write a script, you know, uh, how to tell stories and how to, how to you know, what do you leave in? What do you leave out? Um, and also from Christy, Christy was, you know, like, like the way she would work in terms of developing yeah. character. Uh, I mean, 
in, in what you have to understand about the writing process, you're, you're writing about 10 pages and out of that 10 pages, you're only going to use about one page Absolutely. of the actual work. Right. You know, but you, but, but even though your character doesn't, you have to know like what kind of breakfast cereal does my character eat? What, what color tie does he wear on Mondays? You yes. know, um, you know, does he, you know, did brush his teeth after every meal? I mean, it's like, you know, everything about that character and the more you know about him, the more realistic he can be in terms of, uh, you know, what you're doing with your, with your character. So I learned a good bit of that from working with them. Um, the other thing for me was, was, you know, that's what, that's what my college degree was in, was in English literature and education. Wow. So I, the problem with me with writing was, I knew what the competition was. I mean, mm -hmm. when I would sit down and write, it was like, mm -hmm. this ain't Shakespeare. On the other hand, as an artist, I wasn't trained professionally. So, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, I'd look at it and go like, hey, this looks almost as good as Joe's work. You know, it, it was like, mm -hmm. you know, you know the, the, the people I was imitating, it was like, I had no idea the things I was doing wrong because I, mm -hmm. I hadn't been trained in that thing. Whereas as a writer, I knew right away, like, Ooh, this doesn't quite measure up or this doesn't. So writing for me is just work. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. Yeah. And, and no matter how hard you work, I'm not sure how successful it is all the time either. Hmm. Um, whereas comics, comic, I mean, or, or drawing, drawing is fun. Yeah. So, okay. You, you, Lord Lovecraft, Richard Wood, there's Mad Mummy. Mad Mummy is, is kind of, that's what I've done recently, and that's my favorite because everyone looks at Mad Mummy and they go, "Well, that's you, isn't it?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, "Well, since I reused Ray Fiennes as the character, yes, I look a lot like Ray Fiennes." Yeah. You know? um, but you know, that's that's kind of like like people see me around here. I'm uh, you know I'm wearing like you know the 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 hat like that and the black uh -huh. shirt and the, uh, and whatever. Um, and I was always into you know the the Egyptians and Sax Romer. Yep. Uh, the creator of Fu Manchu. So That's I mean, right. in, in the Mad Mummy series, um, I can't say that out loud. There is a Chinese doctor who, um, who is a major character and his daughter is the reincarnation of this guy's lost love. Um, and so, I mean, the whole thing starts out at, you know, in the first story is a love triangle and that's how he winds up as the Mad Mummy you know, he's, he's been seduced and, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it took me four issues also because the narrator of the book is this cat who is a, you know, um, a sacrificial animal that the, uh, you know, the, the, the high priestess, that's his, uh, his ex-wife brings back from the dead. And like I said, it took me four issues to realize like, that's the mad mummy, <laughs> you know, the, um, the I think other it's guy. so awesome. So, um, and those are all available digitally. Um, and uh, I mean, but it's, it's, it's one of the frustrations. It's like when I was doing fanzines, the first fanzine I did, I, I think I sold 175 copies and I did six issues of this thing. And the last one um, I sold, you know, I sold out the print run of a thousand. And I'm thinking, damn, if I did a comic book now and it sold a thousand copies, mm -hmm. I think I was, you know, it was like, like something special. I mean, mm -hmm. I do this stuff and I just do it. I mean, it's my hobby now, but I'll yep. put it online. And if I have, if I have 50 people who see an issue, it's like, oh, that was a good month. Um, you know, it, it is very humbling in terms of what your market, you know, your audience is anymore. Sure. No, it, it's well, I remember you used to give us like weekly updates on um on your blog of like Lori Lovecraft. The story was always yeah. we always get like a new chapter. Right. Um, and and that's what I do and I still do that on my Vaz Comics blog. That's right. Every I was week. so where can fans find your stuff right now? They go to Vaz dot well, Art. I, you know, I guess the e the easiest way to just be to uh, Google Vaz Comics okay. or Vaz Words. Um, you know, because it's it's uh uh, I've been banned on Facebook, uh, you know, so uh, the, I, I did the Vaz words for years and it was all, it was, it was about illustration and mm -hmm. working in comics and all these things. And it's still available. And, There's still stuff up there. I mean, I still, well, it's still up there. I just can't mention it on Facebook. Got it. Okay. What happened on Facebook is, is, uh, you know, and I, I would put out my life drawings routinely all the time on sure. Facebook. 
nobody complained. Well, a couple of years ago, I I remember there was a Greta Thunberg one, like Time Magazine Woman of the Year. Okay. And I reprinted that cover on my Facebook page and went, congratulations to Greta. It's good to hear, you know, young people are showing us the way and teaching us things. Mm. Well, in the political uh, atmosphere I was in, suddenly the next day, someone started complaining about my life drawings and 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 about you oh, know they're uh, nude I was, but they're not lewd they're nude well they're it didn't blind. matter it was it was like you know what they were complaining about was well you mentioned in Greta oh it, geez it was, it oh. Was, and and so like I said and it's been two years and I still can't use that word Vaz words on Facebook unreal so I still I continue to do Vaz uh Vaz comics okay and in fact I'm reprinting some of the better uh Vaz words blogs Awesome. I mean, I would do them on, on N.C. Wyeth, on, on uh, uh, you know, Robert Fawcett, on, on uh, you know, all the famous illustrators, on, on guys, you know, Kubert, Toth, Frazetta. Well, 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 yeah, I mean, and I do. We don't have a lot more time, but I kind of want you, because you are just a fountain of knowledge and artist. I mean, again, I was, it was in my 20s when I finally really, I caught back up with you, you know, like I kind of walked away from comics collecting, but not so hardcore and came back and I wanted to see where my favorites were and you are still doing stuff. And you really like, so what is, what is it about like Robert Fawcett that you really liked? Cause you really understand these artists and you know, these artists. Um, I was going to say, let me find Robert Fawcett here. So well, I've got, yeah, they're... I've got stuff too. Okay. You've got some. All right. What is it about him? I like. Yeah, well, everything how, on that he, screen. He said he's definitely one of your inspirations. Well, he's a very, very subtle artist. Mm -hmm. Okay, for one thing, it's it, in terms of when Robert Fawcett does a picture, that little guy, you know, those guys in the background reading the newspaper, right, are just as fascinating as as and essential to the story, right, as the main character with all the stuff on his, uh, you know, and a, the the draftsmanship in the drawing is is just impeccable. Agreed. Um, and I mean, the, I mean, it's just, um, there was, there was a, there was a comic book artist named, uh, Lou, Lou Sayers did like Batman stuff back in the forties. And he was friends with Fawcett and, um, somebody, when they were interviewing them and said, oh yeah, Fawcett, he was kind of like a second rate, uh, Nor uh, Rockwell Ouch. and just, and, and, you know, Lou said, oh no. Fawcett was every bit as good as Rockwell Damn. and, and I mean, you know, and, and uh, but he works, he worked in color inks and line. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the stuff is very cinematic and very, um, um, you know, there's, there's a, um, uh, let me see if I can find it here. There's a, there's a picture Fawcett did of a Hercule Poirot story. Um, and um the story is is uh, there's a there's a dead girl that's been found, and Fawcett discovers the body with the. Um, let me make sure I get that in the screen here. Okay, Fawcett or uh, you know Parole discovers the body with the um, uh, the headmistress there, and the look on the woman's face mm. is just stunning in terms mm. of. Anybody else would have been going, oh, right? Or, you know, really, really, you know, really hamming up. And instead, Fawcett captures this look of sadness, a little bit of horror, and just outright fascination. Yes. And I mean, it's it's like I can't think of anybody else who who did stuff like that. Um, and uh, and of course, the guy who turned me on to Fawcett was Chaykin. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So. All right, who else did we talk about? I'm, I'm gonna go through the list kind of quick. Um, we talked about Alex Toth. Why do you, what was it about Alex Toth that you liked so much? I hated Alex Toth when I was a kid. For one yeah. thing, he did an adaptation of um, uh, The Time Machine. And as a, you know, as a 14 year old kid, I was just, I thought Yvette Mimio was probably the most stunning thing that I'd ever seen in my life. And I couldn't understand why when Alex drew the comic book, he got Rod Taylor perfect, but he, you know, he, he couldn't even get Yvette Mimio's hairstyle right, you know, let alone look like her. Um, as I got older and I began to appreciate what it was to be an artist, I understood just how good Alex was. Uh -huh. um, his, um, again, um, 
he uses this thing called the illusion of simplicity, which was another term, you know, Howard used to use all the time and talk about stuff is, is you look at this drawing, like you put on the screen, it looks like, wow, we just did it in a big, bold line. But if you saw Alex's work, you'd realize that he'd spent the entire afternoon working on every wrinkle in those pants and figuring out what to leave in and what to put out. Um, uh, Alex's idol was uh, another illustrator named Noel Sickles. And Sickles was just truly a master at that work. Noel Sickles, I gotta write this down. Yeah. Uh, Cause I, I mean, I remember reading your blog and I think you were the one who turned me on to Alex, was it Alex Toth? Cause I was never a big fan of Alex Toth. And I think you, you must've said something Gosh, now I can't remember. Well, the other thing- I know you got me, you turned me on to Robert Fawcett though. It was your blog that turned me on. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, the other guys that, that I was really looking at when I started in comics were like the European artists, like uh, Paul Guillaume. Sure. Um, who else is in there? Uh, um, geez, Victor De La Fuente. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. Uh, uh, Carlos Jimenez. Um, all these, you know, um, and that work was, I just found, you know, it's just like blowing me away. I remember, you know, um, Orlando, Joe Orlando telling me one time, he goes, Hey, you're looking at those Europeans too much. And he meant it in a very nice way, you know, it was, was, cause what he was saying was like, American fans just don't go for that stuff. And, um, it, yeah. And, and, and it was like, yeah, but they're so good. And, and this, the, you know, it's, it's like, what I've discovered is. Um, as I've gotten better at what I do, I have fewer and fewer fans, uh, because it's, it's like I said, it's, it's like comics is a very emotional and very, you know, uh, it's, it's all, it's, it's, it's got a lot of, of, um, you know, the glitz is very important. Did, and did you ever think you were working towards someone or you're just trying to, you were trying to please yourself when you were and still like now, how did things did, was it always like that? Or do you feel like, well, no, I, I think if you're good, if you're going to do this stuff and be any good at it, you're always working for yourself. Yeah. And you're going to, you, you might yeah. make compromises in terms of like, okay, uh, you're going to start out looking at guys like Robert Fawcett and whoever, but eventually you're going to develop into whoever you are. When last we talked, we talked about Leonard Starr and I know Leonard from, tell me if I'm wrong, wasn't it Little Orphan Annie? He brought back Little Orphan Annie? You know, and one of the ironies of comic books is that the two greatest draftsmen working in comics in the 80s were Leonard Starr and Stan Drake. Mm. Leonard did uh, uh, Mary Perkins on stage, which is if, you know, when you see in my studio, that's what I've got hanging on the walls. Yep. Um, and, um, and Stan Drake did, of course, you know, the, the Heart of Juliet Jones. Uh, Stan finished up his career doing Dagwood and Blondie. That's right. Leonard wound up his career doing um, uh, Little Orphan Annie. But uh, for my money, I think Leonard Starr was probably the greatest writer artist that ever worked in comic strips, even more so than, than Hill Foster, Kniff, um, uh, Alex Raymond. Those are powerful words, Mike. Powerful well, words. I mean, what you understand is as a little 10 year old, as a 10, 11 year old kid, we would get the, you know, get, there was two Sunday newspapers in Detroit. We'd get the Detroit news and my, my cousin down the street would get uh, the Detroit free press. So when the, when the free press, they bring that over to me on, on, uh, you know, the comic books, they, or they bring out the, the comic pages over to my house on Monday. I could not wait to sit down. Mm. It had, I'm trying to think what the big, the, the, there were Dick Tracy in the front and uh, Mandrake. Um, just a second. Sure. Hello. Hello. Oh, the man's in the middle of an interview. Don't think no. Don't think. That's my wife. You know, Hold my calls. Um, but at any rate, I could not wait to get the free press and turn to page two where um the, the the strip you know mary perkins on stage yep. that's the first thing i was looking for and i'm going wait is it this is a comic strip about an actress and it's a soap opera sure 10 year old kid why is he reading this 
And I start and and when uh, Caliber Press reprinted all the stuff, I went back and I had a chance to reread all the stories, and I realized like, whoa, that's why I was reading it. I mean, the depth of the characters. Mm. I mean, one of the one of my favorite characters was Maximus. Maximus was the leading horror actor of the day. You know, he was he was you know he was he he played all these horrific characters, and. And he was this really handsome guy, looked like, you know, kind of like Olivier and, and Cary Grant. And Mary accidentally discovers his secret one day when she touches his face and it's all putty. Yep. And it's just like, oh my God. You know, and, and every story was like that. Oh, um, I mean, just the, you know, the, 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 the characters, the, the way the stories moved along, they were just brilliant. Um, and you know the art wasn't bad either. You know, I mean, I mean, I grew up thinking that that Leonard Starr was like me. Okay, he's my favorite artist. Uh, you know, and he and Joe Kubert are the best that I know. And as I got older, I realized like, wow, you know, Leonard writes even better than he than he draws. You know, um, I got to know him. He told me he's like, yeah, I'm a big fan of opera, and you could really see where the influence of opera and drama mm -hmm. in his stories came from. So. Um, we so, have another, we have an artist. So we both talked about Frenzetta, Frenzetta, excuse me. Um, do you remember where you first discovered his artwork? Well, yeah. When I was starting in comics, this was my Bible. Wow, yeah. I mean, it's it's fallen apart because I've, I've just, you know, used it. But I mean, uh, it was just romance stories that Frenzetta did. And I mean, I, I saw his stuff um on the um uh first place i saw them on were on the paperback covers but also i didn't realize it at the time i was reading i was seeing his work in um um little abner another one of those strips that i was like you know passing over to get to, to mary perkins yep was he was excuse me he was um uh, al cap's assistant and uh uh, for a couple of years on uh, so uh, but I mean the work is just just so visceral mm. in terms of, of mm. um, I mean there's there's another fantasy artist named Boris and I, I as a painter I think Boris is probably a better painter but I never see a Boris cover that I don't think oh when they're done the actors are going to go home take off their costumes and go to their normal life whereas right. like when I look at Frazetta painting I'm going like uh, when this is over, that guy's going to go back into the jungle again. I mean, it was, it was like, he was there. You yeah. Know? It just, um, uh, and, um, like I said, I love that stuff. Um, I, and I do, I hope, I hope fans after they watch this, they go back and they look you up and then they find out the fountain of knowledge you are from all these artists and more that you, you know, and you're able to adapt to. I think well, it's see, we all came from the same place. I mean, I looked at Cubert and Toth. Yep. Okay. Yep. And Star. Yep. I discovered who they were looking at. That was Robert Fawcett. Yep. You know, and and Robert Fawcett was looking at. You know, it's like I said. You go back. They're all. They're I mean, all. You have. You have. Place. You're part of that cycle. You've added me. Now I'm part of the cycle. My students will look yep. at me. They'll look at you. Look at. I. I, I think that's incredible. I love it so yep. much. I think it's amazing. Um, I mean, people would always look at Chaikin and, and my work and say, well, you guys are very similar. And I'm going, we had the same influences, you know? Yep. Um, yep. So, you know, it's, it's, I'm much more whimsical. Howard's much more realistic and, and, you know, in his approach or, or. I agree with that. Uh, yeah. I have to ask a cliche, my last question. Uh, it, it's very cliche and I apologize because I hate cliches. Um, what do you think your, what do you, okay, well, uh, what do you think your legacy is or what do you want to be most remembered for? It has absolutely nothing to do with comics. I didn't think so. Or, yeah. or art. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, this will sound trite, but it's like, you know, hey, uh, my hero and, and, you know, is, is with my dad. Mm. And my dad had an eighth grade education um he was not an intellectual but he was like he never made more than 100 bucks a week hmm. but he was like the smartest and the richest guy that i knew he would walk into a room and kids would just go yeah. and hmm. you know 
the adults would be over in the corner talking about, you know, the day of the business. Blah, blah, blah. All the kids would be around with my dad and he'd be going, Hey, let's do this. Let's do this. You know, it's just like, like everybody that hung around him felt better. Yeah. So, I mean, that's for me, that's like, okay, that's what I got to live up to. Um, Same you know. as a teacher. That's who I want to be. You know, yeah. I want my kids yeah. to look up to me and be, and, and be feel safe and happy and, and, and accepted and all that, you know? Yeah. I mean, you get to be, you get to be Drew Struson and you go, damn, I'm no Rembrandt, you know? And then you get to be Rembrandt and he goes like, whoa, you know, uh, you know, it just, there's always somebody out there that was like so much better or whatever, you know? Sure. And, um, you know, and so, I mean, you get into that, the whole legacy thing. It's like, yeah, that, eh, eh, good luck with that one you know it's it's uh um, i mean mike i have i mean i i can't help but gush i mean i you know you know she hulk seven she hulk in the long run it set the tone for what she hulk would become and i and i'm grateful that fans will be seeing more of who she is and i'm hope the new series does her justice uh you know the 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 latest marvel films seem to really kind of they're they're definitely they're, they're owing it to the original material. And I hope that you and, and David Anthony Kraft really get recognition for it because you it really set the tone for what she hoped to become. She's funny, she's smart, she's sexy, she's strong. Um, that was really important, especially in the early eighties, but even some more now. Um, but I, I mean, I used, man, I used to, my, you know, so my, I was telling you earlier, my partner is, he's a collector, I'm a reader. I read my books over and over. You know, and those same books, I just beat to hell and I, ha I have to rebuy them, you know, because then I became a collector and want to take care of my books. And But I loved that series so much. And I loved your G.I. Joe. I, you know, I, you just, I loved Cloak and Dagger because I recognized you and you just, anyways, growing up, I loved your artwork. And then having a chance to like get to know you through, through your website, through Facebook, um, over the phone. And now here, you're even cooler than I imagined. And I mean, I hate suck ups. I hate it. I hate it so much. I always tell my sister, no one likes yeah, suck give me your five dollars later. I think you're saying that now. Okay. Honest to God, Mike, I can't tell you. It's been such a thrill. You have been such a cool guy. When you talked to me on the phone, you were so down to earth, but I was trying to not geek out. And you're like, it's cool, just chill. You know, like I mean, you put me at ease, and and it was like two guys just hanging out talking, just like tonight. Um, I, I just I think you're awesome, and I, I can't thank you enough for this, honestly. By the way, I'll give you one little tie-in here for the last because you talked to me about movies. Yeah. And you're talking about She-Hulk, and I'm going, She-Hulk. My favorite bit of She-Hulk was actually on a film strip. Mm. And it was literally that. It's it's in one of the, I think it was one of the Avengers cartoons I did a storyboard for. And it's She-Hulk is like is like uh do it's a stunt double for um the the um astronaut. That's right, yeah. Uh, um just a second. Hey, Annie, I'm, I'm still in the middle of this. I'll be done in a couple minutes and talk to you, okay? All right, bye-bye. Um, but at any rate, so it's it's like there's a great segment in film from uh, Marlena Dietrich in Blonde Venus, mm -hmm. where she comes out in this, is um, you know, you see this whole chorus line and they're dragging along this ape and the ape creature at the end climbs up on the stage and the audience is just kind of like, and all of a sudden she like pulls off a glove and there's this white hand that comes out and pulls remember. Off glove, and then she takes off her helmet and, you know, shakes her head. And I thought, Oh, I got to do that. So that's what I did in the She-Hulk segment where it's like the She-Hulk comes out of this thing, you know, like this, you know, just in this, this burn up costume. And she like proceeds to do that whole little, you know, uh, uh, Marlena Dietrich strip where she's taken off, you know, the gloves and the helmet and stuff. And, and uh, so, that was my favorite bit of doing She-Hulk. I do, and I hope I hope we, we see your name in the lights, in credits, because you and David did so much work, and yeah. we'll get him to come back. We're gonna do it. We will definitely come back to this. Great, I'll we'll get to actually meet Dave. It. I know, right? I know. Yeah. I, I, he, he, he's like, who's Dave? I'm like, uh, Dak. <laughs> Dak. <laughs> you know. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Honestly, yeah. I can't appreciate it enough. I can't tell you enough. Thank you. Have a good All night. Right. Take care, Stephen. Bye-bye.